Welcome back to Echo Ridge Gaming, where I've got a couple of really dumb ideas. Let's see what kind of chaos we can get into today, shall we? As you may remember from last episode, we have no Drekos, nor do we have any Thimble Reed, which means we can't create Atmos suits to be able to use the Atmos suit docks. We can use the Oxygen Mask and the Oxygen Mask dock. Wearing those Oxygen Masks, we can then take off into a rocket and hopefully find another planetoid that'll eventually have either Thimble Reed or a Dreco so that we can get into reed fiber and eventually plastic. Because, oh yeah, we don't have access to oil either. But there comes a couple of problems in that. Let me highlight by putting down a temporary rocket platform made out of cobalt. This is not the way. We're only going to use this as a quick example to show you what we're working with. While the dupes are working on that, I wanted to highlight that, yes, I am venting oxygen directly into space. Thank you to everybody in the comments who pointed this one out because chances are it would have been hundreds of cycles before I saw it. Oh, Lady Ruff, what are you doing? Why are all of you up here? I was building a nice little entrance here. Apparently they went all the way down here, jumped up here, came all the way around, and now Lady Ruff is just stuck. Thank you, Lady Ruff. Now let's see if they have enough oxygen to be able to get back. There you go. What are we, a minute and a half into this video? And we already have dupes? Possibly suffocating? That can't be good. You might be wondering why I'm putting an aluminum door here when we clearly don't need to. It's not actually preventing any oxygen or anything from escaping. Rather, the intention is to make sure that at least some of the radiation is being blocked. Another shout out to the comments is all these wonderful wild poke shells are overcrowded and cramped. The reason why is because I inadvertently put them in a room by adding this mesh tile right here. I don't even remember why I added the mesh tile, probably to make it look a little better, but removing the mesh tile makes them believe they're in a much larger room and now they'll be happier, which means they'll continuously eat all the polluted dirt that we drop off of them. And we are definitely going to put a dupe at risk to go grab this aluminum ore because the ores are at a premium. It'll be fine. The lobsters will only snip at them just for a minute. Great job, everyone. See, no duplicates were hurt in the grabbing of that aluminum. Our rocket platform is complete. And this is what I wanted to show you. Our options for rocket types are carbon dioxide engines and sugar engines. That's it. All the other engines are locked under research. For instance, the Radbolt engine requires both applied sciences research and data analysis research. Then we have the steam engine, but it also requires applied sciences research. And then we have both the small petroleum engine and the large petroleum engine, but sadly we don't have any oil, therefore we have no petroleum. And then of course the end all be all of engines, the hydrogen engine. Needs to say, we're not quite ready for that. All right, Echo, no big deal. Just build a carbon dioxide engine. You have plenty of it. Well, I'll go ahead and build it and show you why. It's not exactly everything it's chalked up to be. I mean, sure, we have plenty of carbon dioxide. Look how tiny it is. I get it. You're trying to lift off a rocket using upside down soda bottles, but still, this doesn't exactly give us a bunch of space to work with. So my thought was that we would push hard towards the Radbolt engine, but getting 250 data banks and all of this applied sciences research is going to be a little bit of a challenge. So I think our best bet is to go ahead and start with the steam engine. Now, unfortunately, we're still going to need 20 applied sciences research, which means we need radiation. And I don't want to rely just on this sky radiation either. If we put a Radbolt generator here, and I only want to put one considering the power cost of each Radbolt generator is so much at 480 watts, it would only be giving us 37 rads per cycle. And using the material study terminal, it would take 10 units to get each research point. So we'd only be gaining 3.7 research points per cycle. So we're going to try to speed up that process just a little bit. And that plan starts over here on Inverilin. Old DK Oz is doing just swimmingly. They have plenty of calories here, and their stress is sitting at 33%. Not shabby. We've started marking a bunch of the spindly grubfruit plants to enable our to harvest, which is going to help supplement our meal lice usage. It's not really efficient considering a wild spindly grubfruit takes 16 cycles to grow, and at the end of that 16 cycles, they're giving us 800 calories. And when we take those 800 calories and we divide it by the 16 cycles, that means each wild planted spindly grubfruit is only giving us 50 calories per cycle. Well, considering Doc Oz requires 2,000 calories per cycle, we would need 40 spindly grubfruit plants. And while there are a bunch here, there's definitely not 40. 
Yes, there is a bunch of sulfur here, but we're only sitting at four tons. So I'd rather save that until we have to use it, probably when we bring another duplicate over here, and then we'll be able to domestically grow them. And hopefully by then we will have found and tamed the sulfur geyser, and then we can run spindly grub fruits and grub fruits pretty much forever. Before I sidetrack myself, we were actually talking about how Mr. DK Oz was helping us out with our material study research. And that's because we're digging all the way down through here and grabbing a bunch of these wheeze warts. Just in this one biome by itself, I see five wheeze warts. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any phosphorite here on the home planetoid, just like we don't have much of anything else. Nor do we have any Drecos to make more phosphorite. Do you see the pattern starting to form here? We just don't have anything. So here's the plan. We're gonna wild plant a bunch of wheeze warts and use them to supply more radiation to the Radbolt generator which will then shoot some rad bolts into a material study terminal. I know, I just have a knack at making things just a little bit more difficult than they need to be. But before we get comfortable starting on that, we really do need some oxygen masks. We'll start by putting a nice little crafting station right here, connect it with a little power, and then we're going to put an oxygen mask checkpoint right here, and then follow it up with a bunch of oxygen mask docks. Unfortunately, these all take ore. <laughs> We don't have a lot of it either, so we're going to be very gingerly about how many we put down. Five should be a good start. We only have 13 duplicates, which I'm hoping to be able to grab some more here soon. And then all we have to do is make five oxygen masks, and they also take ore. And I always like to go one more than the amount of docks that we have, and that way while one is being repaired, the spare will be loaded into that dock. Doritos P, what are you doing? And then we're going to make sure we turn on oxygen mask repairing, which conveniently doesn't actually take any more resources. Apparently they just sort of tighten it up a little bit and it works again. Now all the docks do require a source of oxygen. So we're gonna take our pipe and just run it down here. And after one expertly placed bridge, we'll just continue on and connect it right in. We can probably move our gas vent over too while we're at it. Now here's the thing about the oxygen masks. All they do is provide oxygen. They're not gonna prevent any radiation. They don't help protect from the environment as far as thermals. All they do is provide air. Well, that and a minus two to athletics. One benefit the oxygen masks do have over the Atmos suits, other than the fact they don't require reed fiber, is they also don't require any power either. I also wanted to let everybody know that we found the island once again here on Envirolin. For those who watch me stream, this island has become somewhat of a subject of conservation. Chat doesn't like it very much when we go into the island, disturb the island, or anything else. So we're just going to leave this island sitting here for all time. Oh, Sulphur, what have you done? Alright, I think one ladder will be fine to save Sulphur. They don't have a lot of air yet because, once again, Oxygen Not Included decided... Not to tell me that the duplicate couldn't breathe until the last minute. Let's see who has this errand. It's Patrick Gordon. Where are you, Patrick? You are way down there, Patrick. That's not going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this on a one. And then we're going to move Patrick Gordon so it resets the errand list. Now Sulphur Star has that errand. So if they die, it's their own fault. It's not mine. Great job, buddy. I should probably stop allowing people to come out that way. That would probably help. Also on the agenda is we need to start getting into steel. Because while I love making rockets out of aluminum ore and cobalt, it just seems a little foolhardy. Lucky for us, we have plenty of nice and cold water sitting right here. Step one is going to be starting to make some ceramic. Because I like to make the metal refineries out of ceramic. We have plenty of coal and our clay's not doing too shabby. Although that looks like it's going to be an issue sometime in the future. We'll do a quick 20 of those. Along with the ceramic, we're also going to be making some refined carbon. We'll start with an easy 50. We already have over a ton worth of lime. After those components, we make some iron, and then we turn all that into steel. Our wonderful mass system is working great, and using it, we've pretty much swept up the entire top area here. But more importantly, when we do start using the material study terminal, they'll at least have a mask on, so they'll be able to stand there for longer. Yes, don't worry. We're going to protect them from the radiation. While we're waiting on the dupes to do everything else, I figured we'd put down an enclosed telescope. It's sort of a one-time thing, because after they scan the area around you, you can sort of deconstruct it. And then we'll just extend the oxygen line going to the masks right up to the enclosed telescope. Power's not too bad, only 120 watts. We can handle that mostly other than the extreme cost of the conductive wire. And then all we have to do is give Eilart some astronomy, 
Might as well give them data analysis research as well, and then they'll be ready to scan the stars. Speaking of which, it looks like we've sort of fell off the skill bandwagon, and we do have the morale nowadays since all the dupes are eating the barbecue again, so we might as well upgrade a few of them at least. We'll try to keep them all below, say, 10 morale requirement. We have enough ceramic for our metal refinery, so it'll go right here. Now, powering this thing is going to be a little complicated because we still haven't unlocked super sustainability, so we don't have a mature power grid. Now, we're not far. Only about 12,000 kilojoules remaining. So we're going to put down some wheels and some batteries, but we're getting to the point where we can't even afford that, which means we need to start using the supply teleporter input over on Enverilin and sending some copper ore over. Unfortunately, it takes a field researcher to be able to do this. Luckily, they won't even need to be here long. They just need to come in, activate it, activate the output, and then go home. The bad thing is if we do that, Mr. DK Oz won't have a way home for five cycles because it takes five cycles for the transmitter to recharge. So hopefully they're good for a little while. Hey, Eilart, how would you like to go on vacation? Just a little trip, just to the next planetoid over. You'll be fine, I promise. Just step right in here into this little machine. Oh yeah, perfect. It'll only sting for a moment. And here they come to activate the first one. Ooh, they have a little bit of radiation sickness, don't they? Hmm. And activate the second one. Now please tell me why the digger couldn't have just put their hand on the machine. Why does it take a field research scientist? I mean, it looks like even a Dreco or a Pip could have done that. And with their mission complete, it's time for Eilart to go home. You figure the transporter would at least get rid of the radiation sickness? With Eilart home, I figured we probably ought to make some basic rad pills. They only take coal. So we'll do up a quick 25 and we'll take everybody off of them except for Eilart. And that way they'll take a daily rad pill. So while they're working in the enclosed telescope, they're not going to get the radiation sickness. The telescope does have great sunburn protection at 100%, but it's not so great at radiation protection, only protecting from 50% of it. Majin Lord's like, finally, yes, I'm responsible for something in the colony. Poor Dr. Decorator never gets any love. Now in preparation for the steel, we're going to be grabbing some of the last little bits of metal here on this planetoid, or at least the stuff that we're using right now, because we're not touching that wolframite yet. But all of this iron ore needs to be turned into steel. And lucky for us, there's also a bunch of diamond in here. Now, some of the purists are going to be upset because we had to break through the abyssalite to get here. But I'm sure you can agree it was absolutely necessary. Eilart's been hard at work. They've had their dose of their basic rad pill. And even that is not enough to prevent all the radiation. Their current exposure, even inside the enclosed telescope, is 188 rads per cycle. Makes me wonder, if there's a basic rad pill, where's the advanced rad pill? But they're gonna be fine. They don't spend all day up there. Plus, they go to the bathroom. You know, they're fine. But for their hard work, we've discovered two more planetoids. We've now discovered Eidolonin? Eidolonin, which is a Desalins planetoid, apparently packed with minerals and oil. It does have an infectious polluted oxygen vent, a cool steam vent for a little bit of water, but more importantly are its biomes. It has a jungle biome, and the jungle biome has the mighty Dreco. Winning! The other planetoid is the frozen forest. It has a frozen core, which means lots of water, and on top of that, it has a saltwater geyser, a cool slush geyser, and a hydrogen vent. It also has a jungle biome, which means both of these planetoids are options for us. So step one is getting a rover on the planetoid, just to see what we're looking at. Over on Unverilin, we have a nice little setup going. We have a manual generator and a jumbo battery providing power, and then a conveyor loader and a storage bin. Now, the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna tell DK Oz to go get me 20 tons of copper ore, and then we'll eject it from the storage bin, mark it for sweeping, and then select sweep only on the conveyor loader. That way we can control precisely what and how much we're sending over to the home planetoid. But yeah, copper ore, is definitely the first. I mean, right now it has 125 tons, and there's even more where that came from. A lot more. I've also got a little deodorizer working here because there's polluted water off-gassing, so we're gonna use the deodorizer to supplement our clay, and then send the clay over to the home planetoid as well. I should probably put another one over here while I'm at it. And don't you worry, there's plenty of sand over here to be able to run those deodorizers. Another small update on this planetoid is we did unearth a hot polluted oxygen vent. Now it does erupt at 500 C, 
so it's going to be a little while before we can mess with it. But DK Oz is almost dug all the way to the wart seeds. Fun fact, hypothermia doesn't actually cause an increase in stress. Sure, it gives you a minus five to science, machinery, construction, and cuisine, but it doesn't impact stress in the slightest. See that, buddy? You're going to be fine. Sure, the environment's getting a little chilly, but we'll get you a sweater soon enough. We're only about two cycles away from this geyser coming out of dormancy, and it's a good thing too, because we're gonna take all that nice extra chilled water and pump it right into the metal refinery. Afterwards, it's just gonna dump right back in here and be chilled again by more water coming out of the geyser. I did find a small flaw in the automation system that we had put in earlier. If you remember, the brine had to be at least two degrees in order to be used. And once it was, it sent a green signal over to this pump. And the issue that popped up was, as you can see right now, Right now, the ambient temperature is 10 degrees, but there's no water in here. So we installed the hydro sensor that says, if there's not enough water in here, go ahead and activate this pump so we can still fill the water tank, which is being sent down to the electrolyzers to provide oxygen for the colony. But to be honest, the system's gonna be going away very shortly as soon as we get some of that copper coming over from Envarolin. Speaking of Envarolin, DK Oz is having a little problems keeping up with all the tasks, whether that be loading up the storage bins, making sure all their food is taken care of, or getting to even more digging. So I think it is time to bring over a friend. We have 18,000 calories, so I'm not too worried about that, but I'm also going to need to find a better bedroom. We don't have the refined metal here to make ladder beds, and I don't want to demolish the awesome big brain jar to put another cotton here. Now we have a few options. We could send a rancher over, because eventually it would be nice to be able to ranch some of those critters. We could send a cook over, because then we could actually cook all the meal lice, and the spindly grub fruit, that would be helpful. It'd be really good if I had a rancher farmer that could also cook. I think we're gonna go with Doritos P. They have a relatively low morale requirement of seven. Well, eight now because they're also gonna do grilling whether they like it or not, so they should work out just fine. And look, Mr. DK Oz was so very happy about it. And just to make sure they are not on the same schedule, because we're only using one potty for now. Speaking of dupes, with Doritos P settled in over on Envarolin, I think it's time to add another dupe here on our home planetoid of Toxedo. And this Ellie looks pretty good. They have both operating and supplying, and their traits are pretty irrelevant. Welcome to dupe number 14, Dave Hammer. We finished up using the enclosed telescope, and you can tell because you now get the message of area complete, which means all the space that we are able to reveal has been as evidenced by the hexagon now circling our planetoid. So we appreciate the telescope's service and can now decommission it. We're doing some work over here from insulating the cold biome here and the one here. We also got a nice electric grill for Doritos P so they can start making all the wonderful pickled meal and roasted grub fruit nuts and planted some additional meal lice. When all of a sudden we got another colony achievement and I think this is the one. There it is, finally super sustainable. What are we gonna do now? On Envarolin, we're fine with the manual generators. We only have two of them. One over here to run the conveyor loader, some deodorizers, and the grill. And then this one over here to run the massage table and the oxygen diffuser. On Toxedo though, we're about to go nuts. We've had five ranches of stone hatches going for nearly 200 cycles. And for that, we have over 300 tons worth of coal. And it's a great thing too, because I wasn't looking forward to running this metal refinery and its 1200 watt requirement off the backs of this puny system. The only question remains, where am I gonna put our small little industrial brick? Nothing fancy, just something temporary to get us going. You know, temporary. I think this is gonna be a good spot. We already have a ton of carbon dioxide here and it's a little chilly. Well, it's a lot of chilly but it means the heat from the coal generators aren't gonna cause much of an issue. Now, all we really have to do is send over some copper. So we're gonna start by unselecting the copper ore from the storage bin. We're gonna sweep it all up, and then over here in the conveyor loader, mark it as sweep only and select copper ore. Now we know exactly 20 tons are gonna to be sent over. Here comes all that beautiful copper now. It has been so long since we've had any sort of metal ore here. I don't even know what I want to build first. We're still putting the smooth hatch to work and loading up the critter feeder with copper ore because we're going to get a lot more of the refined metal that way than we would have through the rock crusher. For one, it's an achievement we need called down the hatch. 
we have to produce 10 tons of refined metal by ranching the smooth hatch. And right now, the poop production meter says 2.7 tons. We also made sure that the power control stations will start to be able to use the copper. And we're also going to make sure to put a couple of them in our new coal generator power plants. The temporary ones. You know. Here's our completed power plant. The power control stations make it the power plant. We have the auto sweeper that's in range of all the coal generators and the storage bins. And we have those set at a priority four, so they should stay full. Nice little smart battery, 9060 as the standard. Here's where it gets a little wonky though. We're gonna be sending this power spine, or I mean temporary power spine, and sending it sort of up this direction here. And we're gonna put a couple of transformers, temporary once again, to be able to power things like the metal refinery and eventually all this nonsense as well. For now though, we're still creating a lot of hydrogen, so I don't mind that the hydrogen generator stays up here, but we will be getting rid of these manual generators. Speaking of manual generators, this whole system here can go and we can recapture all of this wire as well. The last thing we're gonna be up to today is planting these wart seeds and getting our basic radiation system going. And to do that, we're gonna build some sort of rad room. Now, this is, once again, sort of temporary, because eventually we're going to have Drecos, and we're going to be able to actually feed the Wheeze Warts, and we'll have a much more robust system of radiation generation. We're making some headway in our rad room. Unfortunately, we've had some radiation vomiting. I could give them all radiation pills, but that seems sort of wasteful. Looking that's going to stay up here to do all the rad research, they'll probably get some radiation medicine. Everybody else is just going to have to deal with it. I suppose this is what I get. I now have polluted water inside my salt water. I suppose we'll give Carol one basic rad pill to help them get over it. After a fair bit of effort, we've managed to get the pip in here and they've started planting these wart seeds. These wart seeds have come all the way over from Enverilin and will now power our radiation research. And as soon as the pip decides to plant the third wart seed, I'll be able to show you how this is gonna work. Come on, buddy. One more. Oh, that's a good pip. Now we can figure out where we're gonna get the most amount of radiation. And it looks like this tile right here at about 107 rad bolts per cycle. And here's what the finished product looks like. Our rad bolt generator, as predicted, is collecting 106 rad bolts per cycle. It's gonna shoot them over here and then straight down into the material study terminal. The material study terminal can hold 100 rad bolts. So we're gonna set the rad bolt generator as close as we can where it'll shoot one set of rad bolts into the material study terminal and then the terminal will say hey i'm full on rad bolts and it'll turn the rad bolt generator off that way we're not shooting rad bolts unnecessarily and more importantly not spending the 480 watts unnecessarily we did put a gas vent here to supply a little bit of oxygen for the room and that way the wheeze warts will have an environment to keep cold which will keep the rad bolt generator from overheating and for the box itself we put a few extra tiles above the spot where the scientist is going to be standing. That way the dupe doesn't keep getting radiation sickness. Because remember, duplicate safety is our number one priority here on Echo Ridge Gaming. The rad bolt generator is about to fire for the first time. So we're gonna see exactly how many rad bolts make it over to this point. Because remember, the further the rad bolts go, the more they degrade. And it looks like we didn't have much degrading at all, so we can leave it right there at 101. You're doing a great job, Eiler. Lastly, in today's episode, we've completed our temporary power spine and it's made out of beautiful imported copper ore our large power transformer up here is providing power for the metal refinery and just like that we're into steel production and soon we're gonna have enough steel to be able to put in a rocket platform now we could have built the rocket platform out of something a little less durable like copper but we plan on putting a couple rocket platforms here and using them for the foreseeable future on that subject We've already completed durable life support with our new applied science research and are heading into renewable energy. That way we can unlock the steam engine. And you can bet your bottom dollar that during the next episode, we're going to be taking that beautiful new steam engine and heading off in search of the mystical Dreco. And remember, we still don't have Atmo suits, so it's going to be a great time. I hope you had as good of a time as I did with this episode, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say about it in the comments below. So until next time, happy gaming. And I'll talk to you soon.